I know that maybe I'm late with everything on this. I apologize, and I don't plan to change anyone's opinions by any stretch of the imagination, but I did feel like it may be beneficial if I would just, as part of the <clears throat> city managers and staff reports, if I could just take one topic related to the parking facility and go into detail and then um, and just email me. I'll send you a copy of what I do, uh, my, what I have, and I will certainly try to answer any questions. But I just felt that I would start with, and I'm not going to take every, a whole lot of people's time, because I know I have a habit of rambling on about stuff, but um, I just thought I would go over quickly. This is just simply wanted to go over the, the property that the city acquired and try to put it into some perspective of how I think it sort of fits into the overall plan. And um, I don't have a timeline. When I looked over this right before the meeting, I probably should have put a timeline when I ended it, but um, I was just sort of fitting it. So I, um, I just wanted to show you that, that we made two separate purchases uh, for the property, the one in blue, which we call the Ross parcels, which is uh, the land here we purchased and then we later, uh, and I'll, I'll, I can get the dates for anyone who wants, and then of course we later purchased the McCoy properties. And I will say, then I, I, I do, don't have any hardcore statistics to prove it, but I, one of the appeals that I always felt, and it came from McGill Smith Punching when they did some preliminary work for us, was that the um, topographic levels at, at this point here and the topographic levels at where it hits um, State Route 42 were uh, the same, which meant that when the earth was leveled that we would be able to have this access point. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I, but I did feel that having an ex additional access point was important. Um, just a little quick, this is real quick, this is just all the parcels that were involved in the uh, the Ross parcels, so the total area that we did um, that we purchased was 1.15 acres. It's a total of 11 parcels. There's some pretty small ones in here. <coughs> I will be the first to say I've had discussions with Duke about the um, about the the power um, grid area, and I don't know that in my time with the city I'll see that property get completely. While they do plan to take the decommission. The, the, that property, it is a web of some serious modifications within the distribution system. So um, I, I've large, largely moved beyond that parse property, but here is how we touch the areas that we touch. And these are the, the three buildings that we had removed from the Ross parcel. At the time, there were two residential structures and one shed. The shed largely was sort of in between where the two uh, gravel roads go that take you up to the, the top uh, temporary parking area that we, we purchased so these buildings were moved actually we were able to receive grant funding to remove these three buildings I uh, have a little financial summary at the end um, one of the items that I felt uh, was important was was the access point onto State Route 48 and um, I felt it was important because it will allow, in my opinion, um, it would allow the Warren County and the Claremont County traffic. But it's built in a manner that it's not going to be, oh, there's a, the, the, the arms are down, let's go flying through here and go. It's not built that way. And I, I actually, when I met with the residents a couple years ago who did not like the access point here, uh, where it was originally, which would have lined up with here, and we modified that access point to the first floor to be down here, it really ended up being a blessing. Not only did it appease them that there would not be traffic going up and down First Street, but it even would have made it even more difficult to do any kind of dipsy doodle through town. And um, that was just sort of a side item. Um, I think that the 48 connection ties into some other items that we're trying to do. I don't think it's any secret that the city is working to acquire the mobile gas station. Uh, not a lot of people have seen this, but this is the preliminary drawing of what we plan to do if we purchase the mobile gas station, which is a 100-foot turn lane with a 50-foot taper. The, um, this particular, um, the city traditionally uses Choice One Engineer for almost all of our engineering. The only time I deviate from Choice One is for traffic engineering 
and for environmental engineering. Um, we use TEC and they are the premier traffic engineers. When, we, when I first asked them to look at a very preliminary stage before we began the purchase, the thought of purchasing this property, Ed, as a matter of fact, Ed was a gentleman who was here to talk about the crossing at the bike trail. Ed's response to me was, Dave, if you can pull this off with mobile, this will be a home run for all the traffic on 48 because we've already invested in the smart traffic signals so that all the traffic signals would be able to talk. And one of the advantages is here, while there can be a steady flow of 48 traffic taking right and going west on 40 on West Loveland, um, being monitored by the cameras that know how far it backs up, that tra while that traffic flow is a steady flow here, the traffic flow on West Loveland is able to take a left and a straight and a right, which allows for all time for some serious traffic movement. Going back to what Mr. Butler said before, one of the advantages about the Chimney Ridge development is that it's going to now feed funding into our TIF. The, the TIF for the, that was put in place by the former administration, which was used to purchase um, what is now half of what Chimney Ridge is, was a largely undeveloped TIF, so it wasn't generating any funding. So one of the one of the tasks that I was put on and myself and my staff was, Dave, we got to get a good development up there because that would then generate that TIF. The TIF will then create a significant amount of funding. So what can we use the TIF funding for projects exactly like this? I can use the TIF funding to pay for the purchase of the property because I can tie it back to benefiting that area. So that was sort of our goal. I will tell you, and it's no secret, that I've held off on the funding from the property, that the, the purchase of the Chimney Ridge. I've held, asked Mark to hold off on that funding as I plan to use that funding as a direct leverage towards the purchase of this property when we get to that. There's no secret that we're doing this, so I'm not hiding anything. I just thought it'd come clean. And I think this is a pretty beneficial improvement. And um, it's not exactly how the crosswalks will line up, but it's I didn't pay him a lot of money to do this development. It was just due diligence I had to do, along with what I had to do with Buster, Bureau of Underground Storage Tank Removal. Same thing I had to do to find funding that I've already located to remove all the structures. So there is sort of an alignment there. The McCoy property, I should have put the dates on all these, and I did, and I apologize. McCoy property was a separate purchase uh, X number of months following, as you recall, we did not get grant funding for the demolition. This was straight up. Funding had dried up. The property was removed, and as everyone knows, we've largely um, turned that into a temporary parking area. One of the advantages, the long-term process, and the reason why the McCoy property plays into my opinion is that it allows the centralized intersection. My long-term goal, and I have a drawing, and I will send it out that I didn't, did not get it added in time, is that I have, we have a proposal, and it's very rough, it was put together by our city engineer, where there would be a sidewalk that would line, which would run from the barber shop um, sidewalk, which would tie in and curly coo into this entryway, meaning all of these parking spaces would be removed. But by being able to extend the parking into the McCoy lot, by removing, moving these parking spaces down, meaning the angle ones would be all be perpendicular, we actually would have a net gain within the existing city parking lot of six spaces. And we'd have that lack of park people. We would remove the constant traffic of people, pedestrian traffic walking down Railroad Avenue. So there is sort of the master plan of creating a centralized, all roads would lead to it. Another project that would help, what we need to do to accommodate that is the Harrison Street widening. We applied for funding for the Harrison Street widening in 2021. We were not funded. We were told what we need to do to make that fundable in 2023. That will be our number one priority project in 2023. <clears throat> Reason why Harrison Street project is so important is I can't move forward with anything west of where Carl Brown would come through in the Nisbet Park master plan because all of the stormwater pipes through all the downtown area from basically the city parking lot goes down Harrison, hangs a right and goes through Nisbet. All of that needs to be completely removed and widened. Um, the Harrison Street, Harrison Avenue project would bring that road to code and full widening. The other advantage of the Harrison Street widening along with having sidewalks 
and proper width of the street, um, all new storm piping, curbs and gutters, the whole package, we will be able to utilize that time to strengthen these um, turning radiuses here are very poor. Um, this is, anyone who knows, this is not uncommon to these kind of conflicts. So that is part of that whole project too. So um, that's, that's sort of how the, um, I wanna always show everything, the money from a financial standpoint. So the Ross parcels, there's our total purchase, the legal settlement involved in it, title insurance, so it was 60820, McCoy property. Um, this is everything I can think of involved if I'm missing anything. <clears throat> Building demolition, the Ross properties demolition was 38730. The McCoy property demolition was 13500. And then we, the grant we received for the Ross was exactly what this. So the net um, cost for the demolition was 13,500, um, I believe, I'm not 100% sure of the habit, habitat of that. Um, uh, I missed the dates, which I will, meant to put in there, and I meant, missed Cindy's drawing, but it's very rough, but I will send that out to anyone. But what that shows is how I'm, we're trying to create this one centralized area, and the McCoy purchase was critical. I think it really was critical. If you didn't do anything and never built a parking garage, I still think the McCoy pr property was important because of what it'll allow us to do by moving that away, removing the property, the spaces that everyone just flies into off a railroad, putting in, in, com in compliance with the downtown plan, putting in a stream of sidewalks, which will allow wherever you're parking, a walk down the road. Um, so, um, that's really all I had. I just wanted to talk on that particular topic. Um, and um, I, I, I think I'll do, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try to answer any, I, any questions anybody wants. Just email me. I can send this to you. Um, again, I don't have the dates because I, I, I don't know really remember the dates. Um, and I, I, I think Cindy's drawing I meant to include is important. It's very rough. But I, I meant to include that part of it. But I thought it was important because this took over some time. I thought it was important to at least show everyone. Step one is what did the city acquire over the course of this period of time? So I'll, I'll try to have another topic. Um, if not at the next meeting, the following. I will talk about various facades I would talk about. I'll have, I'll have the city engineer come in. I'll try to, I'll try to address stormwater um, concerns. I'll try to uh, address finances and everything, but this was just, okay, it's a bit of a softball. I agree, I agree I started with a bit of a softball, but I think this is a good starting point to talk about what we purchased. And I would argue that the purchase price of 550 and the purchase price of 111 at today's market were some pretty sick, would be considered pretty good sound purchases and um, um, that's all I had on that. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Mr. Butler? Um, Dave, the Duke property that you, you referenced north of the Ross property, is that part of an active part of the electrical grid as we speak? Yeah. It is. Yes. I've had multiple <coughs> conversations and meetings with um, the Duke representatives and yes, it is scheduled for decom decommissioning and quite frankly when it's decommissioned they don't want it right but then when he explains to me and he starts talking about Mason and Deerfield Township and modifications that need to be made before this can happen it's significant you, you think we're down the list I mean like in terms of it being I think, decommissioned. The, I think the only thing I've really accomplished with my conversations with Duke is that when it's decommissioned they will likely turn it over to the city for a dollar. They don't want them. They don't keep them. They have no interest in it. They don't want to maintain it. You yeah. interested? <clears throat> Here, give it. And they don't put it out for sale, public sale. They, they as I understand it, the uh, municipality where uh, an electrical station is decommissioned has the first option. Yes. Is that true? But I didn't get the impression it was a large dollar amount because, but I do know that when it came to the improvements at Bishop's Quarter and the wires that needed to be immediately modified and moved over to the vet after the fire, uh, it was because they were decommissioning that station and that part of that meant this wire got moved 
that wire was moved within by Duke standards rapid time and didn't cost the city a penny. Right. And they, I, their, I said, well, that's why is that being done so quick? And they said, because we're going to do it anyway as part of the decommissioning. Just shut up and let us do it. And and at the end of the day, we didn't pay anything, and that stopped those wires being right up against the corner of that building. Dry. Second, a second, a second question. One of our speakers today referenced using that parcel as basically like a, 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 a flat lot, if you will, a, a parking lot. If you recall, I want to say it's in the summer of 2020 before Mr. Ping or Mr. Hart were with us, there was a diagram presented by a citizen, as Chris Oberhauser actually, depicting the use of that property as a single uh, parking lot, if you will. Um, have we done any assessment of how many spaces we could get in if that there wasn't a garage there, but just a parking lot? Uh, I've never done that. Um, most of my conversations with Chris were his his thought that most of my conversations with Chris, and Chris was one of the leaders in moving the entryway off of first to where that location is. He was very vocal about it. We we did some walkabouts with all the residents, and it's made complete sense. But the thing that I've always had the conversation with Chris is that he felt very strongly that Harrison should go all the way through. The problem is, is that the topo it's not only the topography, it's that it would put us right into the railroad zone, which isn't going to be permitted. And that's why um, that was most of it. And and if it wasn't that, he, no, I, I no, okay. I've not done so it. We haven't done it, the answer is. I, 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 yeah. Okay, I thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Uh, Bateman? I also feel strongly that Harrison should connect to uh, 48, just for the record. Thank you. <laughs> I understand it's a challenge, but it's one that I, I mean, I, I think that would really open up the, the potential from a, a creating circuits and, and traffic flow. So um, I, I agree with, with resident Oberholzer about the value of that. If it's something that's difficult to achieve, I can understand the compromises must be made. Any other comments? All right. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. There are various uh, committee minutes and reports in your packet. Does anybody have any comments on those? All right. Under city council reports and comments, does anybody have anything under that? Mr. Baker. Uh, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things relative to the, um, the, the, the traffic and parking um, issues that have been raised during open forum and in, in public opinion formats like social media and, and such. Uh, so first of all, I'm really, you know, I'm really grateful for the discussion that's been engendered uh, as a result of, of uh, the citizens. I think that's the whole point of the democratic process is the freedom of speech, freedom to petition the government. I think that's extremely valuable. Um, driving back from the uh, driving back from the retreat we had on Saturday um, and seeing people with signs and, and you know, I'm encouraged. That's bringing the, the issue to the public forum and I think that's good. Having more people aware of this, um, many of our residents don't attend uh, city council meetings. They don't read city council minutes. They don't have any idea of, of, of what's happening on an ongoing basis. And so um, your participation is uh, helpful to uh, get the cause of getting more people aware of uh, some of the things that we're doing to address traffic and parking. Uh, another, so thank you for that. And, and I'm encouraged by Mr. Kennedy's uh, decision to use the city manager's uh, report section to again illustrate, you know, the interconnectedness to all of this. I think that's extremely valuable as well. Uh, another point I'd like to make is uh, around the conversation about creating a traffic committee. Uh, this was something we did discuss at the strategic uh, goal setting retreat. And uh, some context around um, our discussion was, uh, I mean, at least from my perspective, was first of all that overwhelmingly this is the number one issue for everyone in Loveland, traffic and parking. And a couple speakers referenced it's an evergreen issue. It's something that uh, uh, many councils before us and, and perhaps after us will be having to adapt and create a strategy around how to solve these issues. Um, so when it comes to 
who should be charged with addressing these issues. If this is, in fact, the number one priority for the folks in Loveland, and we're looking to try to uh, assign responsible uh, folks, I can't think of anyone better, and I think Mr. Phelps mentioned this at our retreat, that it's really us here and the staff and the people that work for the city. We're the ones responsible for addressing uh, solutions to this issue. And we need to do that with public engagement, of course. Uh, that's the best way for us to sort of field test our proposals and to understand if we're on the right track or what are other folks' opinions. But when it comes to trying to hand pick five residents to help us understand what to do about traffic and parking, it'd be very difficult to find the right five people. I think everyone has a solution that they could offer. Uh, and so how would we determine whose uh, solutions merit uh, more uh, consideration than others? Um, another question that has come up is the idea of, uh, you know, the residents being able to vote on whether or not a garage should be uh, on the agenda. Um, and so this idea of a referendum has been uh, raised a couple of times. And in an email that I sent to uh, Ms. Enda that has been referenced a couple times in open forum, she asked some questions, uh, several questions about the garage. And one of them was, do you believe that um, uh, the citizens should vote on uh, on this and and my answer was if we were going to ask for direct taxpayer contribution like a, a levy to fund a garage yes I think we, we should ask the residents to vote similar to what we did when we asked the residents if they wanted to have a rec center built I, I don't remember the details of this but I believe it was in the form of a tax levy that would help to fund that uh, facility in that case a referendum is more than appropriate that's the right course of action for a local government to uh, put that decision up to uh, uh, the residents. But I believe that we are a representative democracy, and what we're trying to do is find creative ways to do this that won't have a direct impact on the taxpayer. And so in that case, it's probably more appropriate to do the work that we are currently doing to try to find solutions to budget for a, a proposal, to uh, look at the different uh, solutions that could exist in a hypothetical. Now that we've you know, acquired property on which something like this could be built. We're setting the table for uh, a myriad of options uh, that could exist in the future, and none of which currently exist other than the fact that we have invested uh, funds to uh, buy the property uh, in which something like this could be built. So I just wanted to go on record with my opinions about those two things during this uh, format, and then again, just a big thanks to, um, uh, to Mr. Kennedy and, and for the staff, because what we have been doing over the past, you know, since, since his tenure, are these small incremental moves. And it's, it's you know, he's, he's playing chess with this, it's a strategic uh, board. And, you know, he's moved pawns around to try to create a, a, a field where we can actually make some big moves. And when you're playing chess and you're at that stage, that's where you have your hand on, you know, the bishop, and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. You're not making those moves haphazardly. You're thinking about very carefully and strategically what you're going to do and what impact it will have on uh, everything that follows. So uh, again, I think that we do owe, uh, encourage uh, uh, more transparency uh, in terms of getting all of the information out. Um, and I, I think that our residents have really done a great job. They've done their part to try to uh, get us talking a little bit more about this. But um, it's not like we weren't talking about it before. I think we're just getting closer and closer to uh, that board being uh, set for uh, a significant move that can have a lasting impact on uh, traffic and parking. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments or any other topics? Mr. Butler? Yeah, I also want to recognize the enthusiasm and, and passion of those individuals who came out um, on Saturday. And, and I also recognize that there's very passionate interest on the other side of the issue as well. Uh, people who support the building of the garage for various reasons that have been discussed at length tonight. Um, and I think what, and I'm, I'm not a person who believes that every issue should be up for, for referendum. You can over, California is an example of a state which is almost out of un, ungovernable because everything is subject to referendum. But here, in this case, there are passionate 
positions on both sides. And whatever decision this council makes, we're going to have a lot of people upset about it, one way or the other. But I trust the good faith of both sides, that if this matter were put to a vote, that those people would, the losing party would accept the results of an election. And it's a way to heal people. It's a way to heal the community. And as we've heard tonight, there are passionate positions on both sides of this issue. It's the very kind of topic and very kind of issue which lends itself to putting it out to the public, yay or nay. And as I said, I trust both sides that they would accept the results of a Democratic vote. You know, so I'm, I'm going to continue to push for it. My colleagues might get sick of hearing me talk about it, but I think that in this case it's appropriate and should be considered. Any further comment, Mr. Hart? Here's, here, so I've, here's one thing I would say about the, about a referendum and in terms of where we've been and where we are right now. In terms, in terms of a, a referendum on a garage, at, at present, we don't have a proposal. So there's, there's nothing to have a referendum on at present. And I'm not saying that when we get to a place that you know, we have that discussion. As Mr. Butler says, when the, when the time is right, he says all time. When the time is right, we'll have that discussion. I think we kind of need to put the horse back in front of the cart here and let Mr. Kennedy continue to go through these updates and where we are and where we go and, and talk about a referendum when we get to a place where we have a, an actual proposal to discuss with the community. So with that, I close. Thank you. Any further comment? Vice Mayor? Just, uh, you know, my observation would be passion is good, and ultimately, passion can be the product of not being informed or not understanding things. This process of this council, in years before, as well as the time that's yet to come, in terms of the discussion of the garage, I think has a duty to sort of just passion the discussion, present facts. Um, and dialogue is fine on this, and I think that's exactly what we're doing. There's no um, call, I think, for any kind of rush to judgment on this project until we go through the process. But be present for the process. Talk to us, and uh, we'll continue to you know, move the, the chessboard along. I, I don't know where it'll end up, but uh, the process, I think, is a good one. And you know, the other point I'd make is, we're blessed in this city to have a very highly skilled professional staff. You hear us sing the praises of Dave, and it's, it's completely merited. But we also have people that consider for things that are being undertaken by the city, such as do we want a parking garage, what impact it will have on the environment. There are people, and I mentioned our city engineer, who can weigh in on that and have already, and perhaps when uh, Cindy's here. Uh, she'll she can answer some of these questions, but we're we're again not rushing into something that is is going to be um, detrimental to the environment. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment? All right. I do want to address something that actually is born of this um, perhaps passion over a garage and uh, the public outcry to the degree that there is one. Um, something that occurred over the weekend. There was a Xavier University student that asked to interview me for a class, which is something I do quite often, um, at least Zoom or telephone interviews. He had to interview an elected official regarding an issue of the day, asked to discuss the parking facility. I agreed. Um, very nice young man. Not in the interview, as he was packing up his uh, cameras, which took quite a while, uh, so we had a nice long discussion. Um, I asked him, well, what are you going to do with all this, um, with the entire interview? He said that he was going to have to pare it down, something like two minutes. Um, he said, I'm only sharing it with my professor. He actually joked and said, don't worry, you're not going to see this on YouTube. Um, I was taken by surprise then, this past Friday, when an individual with his own purported news website emailed um, asking me about something that I said in that interview and said that he had seen it um, on YouTube. I forwarded that email to the Xavier University student. Um, I reminded him that he had specifically said that he was not going to put it on YouTube or share it with anyone publicly, um, only with his professor. I told him I certainly stood behind anything that I said to him. Um, in the interview that night, he just should have been honest with me um, when, he, when he said that. 
um, this individual who had taken the student's video from YouTube without permission, he then published an article with that video claiming that several people said that the student felt that the mayor was harsh and that the email made him uncomfortable. I literally just told you what I said in that email. Um, and that several people he spoke, uh, several people spoke with the student and said that he's now scared and worried that the city might retaliate against him. Uh, the same news individual claimed on social media that I went after the student, scaring the bejesus out of him. Um, the young man actually sent me a lengthy email the following day. He explained that he was required for this assignment to upload the video to YouTube so that his professor could have access to it. Um, he said that the individual who took the video for his own use apparently was alerted to it somehow because uh, some citizen with Google Alerts and certain names um, sent the alert which directed them to the video. The student said he had recently learned that he was referenced in an article by the same person uh, without even being contacted by the individual. He said he'd never spoken to the individual, had never heard of their online site. He said he had deleted the video from YouTube not because of some threat from me, but because, quote, I do not and never did want this video to be public. I replied, thanked him, said I believed him completely. Um, I reached out to the student again um, on the following day to apologize for jumping to the conclusion that he had uh, violated what he had told me. He, we spoke by telephone. He would not even let me get my apology out. He said he understood completely why I emailed him. He said, he said I literally specifically told you you would never see it on YouTube. Um, he's, and he said he was very upset that this happened. He was upset that this, the person that was at the center of all of this had taken his work product and used it the way he did. He said he had asked that person to take the video off his site to take down the article, but he had not done so. And he said he was looking at other avenues to address that. Um, the young man was certainly upset this weekend, no doubt about it, but it wasn't with me at all. He and I are just fine. In fact, uh, I think if I'd asked him to come here tonight and say this himself, he would have certainly been willing to do that. Um, but he's been through quite enough, um, being used for someone's personal agenda and financial gain. To me, perhaps the most disgusting part of this is that this individual who started all this painted this young man as some pathetic, scared little boy, both in his article and on social media, having personally spent a good amount of time with this young man and talked to him um, this weekend. I can assure you nothing could be further from the truth. The student is very poised, very sure of himself, professional, determined, certainly not scared of anything, not anything that I did, that's for sure. Um, finally, just to touch on the, the controversy that was supposedly um, at the heart of all this um, with this article, I had mentioned in this interview that come to, came to my attention that I, there was a business owner that said that he had come to Loveland after having been told by a council member that we were addressing the parking problem. This was presented in the article as if such a statement to a potential investor was somehow nefarious. Um, to be clear, I see nothing wrong in telling someone who is thinking about spending money investing in our city, but worried about whether or not there is parking after we've already purchased the, the properties to build a parking facility and that is out in the public realm telling them, oh no, we're taking care of parking. Uh, but the council member that made that assurance was not me. If the council member that did wishes to, to own it, so be it, but it, it wasn't me. But again, I have no problem with it. I, I think that's what we should be doing is um, touting what we're trying to do to address the problems in this city. Um, I felt that this was something I needed to mention here because this became some overblown, ridiculous uh, mess for, for this young man over the weekend. Um, I think it was completely un unnecessary. I, I do feel bad for him and that he unfortunately learned the hard way, the ugliness of local politics. Um, if there is a silver lining, I will say this. I asked him, well, I hope you at least get a good grade on this project, and um, he said he got an A. So I suppose all is well that ends well. But. I felt the need to, to set the record straight because I have been uh, unnecessarily vilified and this, this young man has been unnecessarily used in this whole scenario. That's all I have. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Oh, we do. We have a motion to adjourn session.